Alrighty, if my physics teacher had not found my channel, he's probably gonna find it now. Shouts out Mr. Jackson if you see me on the recommended list. I'm just saying. I know you're a big Veritasium fan. Okay, it's a, this is kind of an inaugural video. I get asked to watch Matt's Fundamental Flaw by my man's, uh, the banana something? I forgot his name. Uh, sorry. <laughs> but he told me to react to Matt's Fundamental Flaw. I don't know if I want to, though, because I've kind of already seen it, but I might have forgotten enough about it, because I think it was, a little, like, a while ago. Uh, I think I, I might have, you know, I might watch it again just to go back and, and recollect some of that information, you know, get it to stick in the brain a little bit better. Veritasium, 35 on trending, by the way. This video dropped two days ago, I think, and it's already at 3 million views, just to show you that this man, Veritasium, makes some amazing content sort of science related as you can see here by the the chemistry symbol you know very science related um let's do it let's get right into it i don't know what else to say i mean fuck it am i gonna keep people waiting i don't know let's see the scientist who killed millions and saved billions tell us homie let's the see the 1918 nobel prize for chemistry is probably the most important nobel prize ever awarded it was given to German scientist Fritz Haber for solving one of the biggest problems humanity has ever faced. Which is what? His invention is directly responsible for the lives of four billion people today. How so? But when he received the lives of four billion people today. He's responsible. Can you but really say he he's re responsible for four billion? What did this guy do? What did he solve? World received hunger? his prize. Many of his peers refused to attend. Two other Nobel Prize winners rejected their awards in protest, and the New York Times wrote a scathing article about him. He is simultaneously one of the most impactful and tragic scientists of all time. Perhaps more than any other single person, he has shaped the world we live in today. You picked my interest, who is this guy? Making him sound like a god. Part of this video is sponsored by Ren. More about them at the end of the show. Okay. Ren, shouts out Ren. Let's do this thing. If you are an American citizen and you find not. an island with a lot of bird poop on it, well then you can claim that island for the United States and the US will have your back. The president is authorized to send in the Navy and the army to defend your newly discovered poop covered island. There are currently 10 American islands that were claimed in this way. And even though the law that made this possible was passed in 1856, it is still in effect to this day. And even Midway, though the law- Midway Atoll? I know that place. And I think I also know Baker and Howland. No, I don't know how I fucking know these. But what, so- what kind of stipulation that is made that? Made this possible was passed in 1856. What kind of stipulation is it that if there's bird poop we can cl and then you claim it? So what could it be like a could it is it have to not belong to anybody? Like pretty much every piece of land is under some country's sort of jurisdiction at this point. And there's only like three spots that aren't. You know, one in Antarctica, which people are making claims. One in uh, between Egypt and, and Sudan, I think. And the, the other one in, like, Croatia, I forgot. Like, th that's what's called Terra Nullis, right? Um, which is unclaimed land. No man's land. Uh, but why does it have to be... I don't think there's any island that you could just find shit on it and then claim it to be yours. Because it'd have to be under some other country's jurisdiction, right? Like, what if I step into some Danish-owned island... Uh, which is technically under their jurisdiction because it's in their waters or something. I don't know. They have, they call, they called it, they call dibs. But if I put, find bird poop on it and I put a flag on there, and I'm a U.S. citizen, you're telling me the Navy's gonna come back me up on my claim? And if the Danish army has anything to say about it, we're gonna go to war. Maybe, maybe Danish isn't a good idea because maybe they're in NATO. I don't know. Are they in NATO? I forgot. <laughs> it maybe, is still maybe a country that's in not in NATO to this day. So why did people want poop-covered islands so badly? They're not gonna reinforce that. They're, Biden ain't doing shit. There yeah. are a few dozen islands off the coast of Peru where millions of seabirds gather to mate. And the waters near the island are full of fish. And these millions of birds eat the fish and then they poop. 
a lot. Since the region is hot and dry, this poop solidifies and accumulates over millennia. There are cliffs of bird poop 30 meters or 100 feet high. God damn, that's a lot of poop. Holy shit, that's a lot of fucking poop. Technically, bird poop is called guano, and by the mid 1800s, buying and selling bird guano was big business. The price rose as high as $76 per pound, meaning you could trade four pounds of guano for one pound of gold. God so damn. why was there such a big market for bird poop? Well, to answer that, we have to look inside the human body. Okay. By weight, most of our bodies are made up of oxygen, carbon, and hydrogen. But the fourth most common element is nitrogen. Nitrogen is part of the amino acids that form proteins. It's part of hemoglobin, the compound that carries oxygen in red blood cells. And it's a central component of DNA and RNA. Nitrogen is essential for all life on Earth. We get our nitrogen by eating plants, or animals which have eaten plants. And plants get their nitrogen from the soil. The problem is, if you farm the same soil year after year, you harvest the nitrogen out of it. And eventually, there isn't enough nitrogen for healthy plants to grow. They can't produce enough chlorophyll to photosynthesize, which stunts their growth. Their leaves turn yellow, and they are more susceptible to pests and disease. Crucially for farmers, nitrogen deficiency means smaller yields. The, 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 this this what Sad Guru be talking about with the leaching the topsoil? Is that what's going on there? Because like now there's there's just not enough nutrient in the soil, and then all the food that we're gonna get out of it is just gonna get shittier and shittier over time, and then in like a few decades or so, a couple. Maybe even, I don't know. I don't know the exact time frame, but we're going to have people that are... It's not that there's going to be a shortage of food. There's going to be a shortage of nutrients. So there's going to be people that are like pretty malnourished, even if there's food. Because that food is just going to be so shitty and it's going to be so low quality that those people just aren't going to be getting what they need. Or like they're just going to be really weak people. You know, so we're going to have to see what we do about that. Let's see if we can have another scientist that's going to come in and maybe he'll win another Nobel Prize. Maybe he'll save another billion people. Hopefully. Hopefully. The way to fix this is to add nitrogen back into the soil, which is where bird guano comes in. Guano is up to 20% nitrogen. Hundreds of years ago, Incan farmers realized that adding guano to their soil made crops grow taller. This is what allowed them to grow food in places that were previously unfarmable and expand their empire. South Using America's rich deposits of bird poop did not go unnoticed by the rest of the world. In 1865, Spain went to war against its former colonies of not Peru, guano, Chile, Ecuador, and Bolivia not guano, for please. control of their guano-laden islands. But such was the world's appetite for nitrogen that by 1872, guano was running out, and Peru banned further exports. The world would need another way to get its nitrogen fix. And that's where that law comes in, because guano so uh, This price? was a crisis. Uh, William Crookes, a British chemist, made a come? dire prophecy in 1898. With the world's growing population and dwindling supplies of nitrogen, he said, we stand in deadly peril of not having enough to eat. In less than 30 years time, he argued, people all over the world will be dying of starvation but he also proposed a solution. It is the chemist who must come to the rescue. It is through the laboratory that starvation may ultimately be turned into plenty. The chemist? Starvation may ultimately be Why turned into Why the chemist? Why not plenty. the biologist? Because here's the thing. Okay, Nitrogen isn't rare, it's common. 78% of the air is nitrogen. But it's in a form that plants and animals can't use. <laughs> Two atoms of nitrogen triple bonded together. This bond is one of the strongest in nature. The way to measure the strength of a chemical bond is by the amount of energy that's required to break it. So to break apart two chlorine atoms, for example, would take two and a half electron volts. 
To break apart two carbons requires 3.8 EV. Two oxygens, 5.2 EV. But to break apart two atoms of nitrogen requires 9.8 electron volts, a tremendous amount of energy. Damn. Some pretty, they're, they're stuck together, you know. They're not letting go. Those guys Do are family. Do mushrooms freak you out? These won't. But it's no wonder shrooms get a bad rap. Word has it, Vikings would- Okay. It was looking interesting, but I'm not. This is not what that video is about. Not about mushrooms. There are two processes that do this naturally. Lightning? Lightning, Lightning breaks? releases so much energy, it breaks apart N2 into individual nitrogen atoms. They then quickly react to form nitrogen oxides. And these molecules stay in the atmosphere until they react with water droplets in clouds and fall to the ground in rain. There are also a few types of bacteria living in soil that can break the N2 bond, using a tremendous amount of energy to do so. And they make nitrogen available for plants. But bacteria can only it? replenish the nitrogen slowly. What? Electric volts? Electron volts? How do they have the power? You're telling me those little things can create EVs? How are they, how are they, produ how are they making EVs to cut atoms? No, wait, to cut molecules, whatever. Huh? What? That doesn't even make sense. I don't get that. And there's not enough lightning to produce nitrogen compounds at scale. So chemists tried. In There's 1811, Georg Hildebrandt mixed nitrogen and hydrogen in a sealed flask, trying to make ammonia, one of the nitrogen-containing molecules found in guano. When that didn't work, he submerged the flask 300 meters underwater to increase the pressure. And that didn't work either, but he was on the right track. Increasingly sophisticated versions of these experiments were carried out over the following hundred years. All of them failed. So when Fritz Haber became interested in this problem in 1904, he was joining a long line of failed chemists. He was 36 years old, working as a low-level academic at the University of Karlsruhe. He was also a new father, with a two-year-old boy named Herman and a wife, Clara, who was one of the first women to get a PhD in chemistry. Sheesh. Driven by Watch pride it. and competition with another scientist, Haber spent five years on the problem. Ah, uh, yes, idea competition. Was that's, a, that's a good driving force right there, competition. That'll get you to work. To combine nitrogen and already. hydrogen, not only at high pressure, but also at high temperature, and in the presence of a catalyst, something that lowers the amount of energy required to split diatomic nitrogen. To, I'm sorry, but, you, I'm sorry, also, I'm sorry, you lost me, you lost me, you absolutely lost me. I gotta, I gotta watch that again. At high temperature, and in hydrogen, not only at high pressure, but also at high temperature, okay. and in the presence of a catalyst, something mm -hmm. that lowers the amount of energy required to split diatomic nitrogen. Oh, okay, so you're gonna give it high pressure, you're also gonna give it high temperature, and you're gonna use a catalyst, which is like a buff. You're gonna use a perk, right? You're gonna use your tactical ability to then put in this catalyst, which is gonna make it even easier for you to split said molecules. Okay. To do this, new experimental apparatus had to be invented. Haber worked tirelessly on this project, building equipment that could tolerate ever higher temperatures and pressures. He also got lucky. At the time, he was moonlighting as a technical consultant for a light bulb manufacturer. So there he had access to lots of really hard to find materials, like the element osmium. Osmium is rare. In his day, there was only about 100 kilograms of the refined metal in existence. I don't even know what the fuck that is. I've never even heard of no osmium. What the hell is that? But the company he worked for was experimenting with using it for filaments in their light bulbs. So they had most of the world's supply. Hopper suspected it might make the perfect catalyst. So he brought a sample back to his lab. And there did in the third week legally, of- Or did he do that under, you know, he do that on the down low though. He did that low key. Like he wasn't supposed to be bringing that back. That's probably, he probably stole some of that shit, but shit. If, if looking at this title, it seems it, it might have been worth it. Let's see. Did he bring the osmium back? Is this the greatest catalyst for this? 
And then this is what's causing me to be alive right now. Because this man smuggled some osmium in, in his... In, no, I'm not going to say that. March 1909, Haber placed his sheet of osmium in the pressure chamber. And then he pressurized and heated the nitrogen and hydrogen to 200 atmospheres and 500 degrees Celsius. Under these That's conditions, hot. the triple bonds broke apart and nitrogen reacted with hydrogen. Of the total gas mixture, 6% turned into ammonia. When the gas was cooled, one milliliter of ammonia dripped out the end of a narrow tube into a beaker. An elated hobber rushed from one lab to another, yelling, come on down, there's ammonia. Germany's biggest chemical company, BASF, commercialized Haber's process. Within four years, they had opened a factory in Oppau, producing five tons of ammonia per day. Damn. People spoke of making bread from the air. With the fertilizer from this industrial process, on the same plot of land, farmers were able to grow four times as much food. And as a result, the population of the earth quadrupled. There's a good chance you owe your life to Haber's invention. The Earth supports 4 billion more people today than it could without nitrogen fertilizer. In fact, around 50% of the nitrogen atoms in your body came from the Haber process. Oh, the God. invention made Fritz Haber a wealthy man. He got a promotion, becoming the founding director of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute house. for Physical Chemistry in oh, Berlin. Oh, no, that's an institute? That's founding not his house. That's, 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 that's a wealthy mansion. man. I thought man's had an invention. He created his own, own little ammonia sample, like, like little shit. And then all of a sudden, he just retired, and he just spent the rest of his days just smoking out of a crack pipe and, and living in a big... Like, I thought that was his house. He got a promotion, be becoming house, right? the founding director of the yeah, Kaiser man, Wilhelm should... Institute for Physical Chemistry in Berlin. He also befriended some of the best scientists of his day, including Max Planck, Max Born, and Albert Einstein. I thought that was Albert. After Einstein separated from his first wife in 1914, Damn. he stayed the night at Haber's house. But if Haber was so well regarded, why was he shunned by colleagues when he won the Nobel Prize? Well, it all comes down to what happened in World War I. Mm. When the war broke out, Haber volunteered for military duty. Unlike pacifist Einstein who denounced the war, Haber was a patriot. He wanted to use his expertise to help his country. Only a few months into the war, the German army was already running out of gunpowder and explosives. Ammonium nitrate, besides being an excellent fertilizer, is also an explosive. Just look at what happened in Beirut in August of 2020. I remember that shit. Bro, that shit was fucking wild, bro. I remember that shit. That shit was fucking crazy. In Beirut crazy. in August of 2020. Oh my god. Woo! Shit! A warehouse containing almost 3,000 tons of ammonium nitrate caught fire. And in the extreme heat, the fertilizer detonated. The blast, which could be heard hundreds of kilometers away, killed at least 217 people and injured thousands more. Seismometers oh, registered shit. an artificial earthquake, measuring 3.3 on the Richter scale. This is just one of many fertilizer-related explosions. The Oppau plant, where Haber's process was first put into practice, would also explode in 1921. And the reason is nitrogen. We've already seen that it takes a tremendous amount of energy to break apart nitrogen's triple bond. But the flip side of that coin is that when two nitrogen atoms come together and form that bond, a huge amount of energy is released. The explosions of gunpowder, TNT, nitroglycerin, and ammonium nitrate all form diatomic nitrogen gas as a product. And the formation of that triple bond is where these chemicals derive much of their explosive energy. Haber so lobbied to convert the factories using his process to make ammonia for fertilizer 
to create nitrate for explosives instead. His superiors believed such a conversion to be impossible, but Haber persisted, and soon his chemical process was at the heart of the German war machine. From bread out of the air to bombs out of the air. In 1939, an international organization. So, Dave's making by bombs out of that same nitrate? But Haber thought chemistry could make an even bigger contribution to the war. In December 1914, he witnessed a chemical weapons test. He was unimpressed. Haber believed that he could do better. He set out to make a gas that was deadly at low concentrations and heavier than air so it would sink into enemy trenches. Projectiles carrying chemical weapons were banned, at least in theory, by the Hague Convention of 1899. Abstain from the use of projectiles, the sole object of which is the diffusion of asphyxiating or deterious gases. But in practice, after the start of the war, really Germany, France, Come and on. Britain all experimented with chemical weapons. Haber converted his wing of the institute into a chemical weapons laboratory, and after only a few months of work, he zeroed in on chlorine gas. An employee, Otto Hahn, expressed his discomfort about the new weapon. Haber told him, innumerable human lives would be saved if the war could be ended more quickly in this way. All right. Right, good justification. At 6 p.m. on the 22nd of April, with the wind blowing toward the Allied trenches, German troops released 168 tons of chlorine from over 5,000 gas cylinders. The wall of gas advanced across the battlefield. Since chlorine gas is two and a half times heavier than air, it sank into the trenches of the Allied soldiers. Any soldier that inhaled a lungful of the gas suffered a terrible death. Chlorine irritates the mucus lining of the lungs so violently that they fill with liquid. The soldiers effectively drowned on dry land. Damn. More than 5,000 Allied soldiers died this way in the first attack. That's crazy. Honestly, Haber though, honestly. was promoted to the rank of captain. And a week later, he was back home in Berlin. What the fuck? What did I do? Was promoted to the rank of captain. And a week later, he was. Haber was promoted to the rank of captain. Captain. And a week later, he was back captain home in Haber? Berlin. So this man goes from being a a randomly a random Joe schmo, right? Just an education guy, thirty six, whatever. For whatever reason, he he gets into that problem with the soil. Says, okay, I'm gonna compete with this person. I'm gonna compete with this scientist. And he got lucky because he worked uh, at. He said that he was some. some he, he had some technical expertise at, uh, at this technician place where they had this uh, uh, element or chemical, whatever of whatever the fuck it was called. I already forgot it. Um, but then he used that thing. He smuggled it, took it back home, created a mixture of. It, he put it in there as a catalyst for that the, this machine that he was using to heat it up and, and to heat up and pressurize uh, nitrogen molecules. And then when he did this, he realized that it did break apart, and then he created ammonia. This shit then meant that you could put this as you could use this as fertilizer for plants, and therefore f quadruple the shit. So the population at the time was two billion or one billion two one to two billion it had to have been right two billion I think at the time maybe something like that and therefore if it's quadruple because now we're at eight billion so maybe so maybe okay so that's what happened and then he's he's a patriot so he gets involved in the war um and then he goes and is he fighting out there? Is he with the rifles or is he just like like just inventing shit for them? I think he's just inventing shit for them. Creates the helium gas, whatever chlorine. I mean, not helium. Um. And now he's become a captain. I mean, this guy is just on the come up. Like if you ask me, this guy is absolutely. He's this guy is a fucking. He means business. You know, he's he's on the straight up come up.
like with all of this shit that he's doing, man. He's been, he's been doing a lot this century so far, right? And we're all, we're not even that deep. This is what 1915. Come on, dog. On the first of May, the Hobbers hosted a dinner party, and after the party wound down, Fritz took sleeping pills and went to bed. He died. But that night, his wife Clara took his gun and went outside into the garden. And there, she fired a single shot into her chest. Her 12-year-old son, Herman, heard the shot and ran outside to find his mother as she lay dying. Why the fuck did she do that? The next morning, Fritz Haber was on a train to the Eastern Front to supervise a gas attack on the Russian army. Some have claimed Clara killed herself because of her husband's obsession with chemical weapons. And that may have been part of it, but honestly, we don't know because no first-hand accounts survive that support this inter- Because there's a brief passage about Clara's suicide in the passage, Gorin stated that Clara was vitally affected, Gorin, 1967, 71, by her husband's involvement in WW1, chemical warfare, and committed suicide after a heated argument with Fritz about what she considered to be a perversion of science and a sign of barbari- bar- barbarism? Barbarism? Gorin, 1967-71. Gorin gives no evidence or sources for either the scenario or these statements. Apparently, the much-quoted phrase about the perversion of science and barbarism ascribed to Clara is Gorin's own, apart from his political affiliation, whatever. Interpretation. What we do know is that Clara was deeply unhappy in her marriage. In 1910, after being married yeah, for eight woman, years though. to Fritz, she wrote to a friend, what Fritz has won during these eight years, that and still more I have lost. And what remains ahead of me fills me with the deepest dissatisfaction. After Clara's suicide, Haber spent the rest of the war running his institute, researching chemical weapons, gas masks, and pesticides. By 1917, the institute employed 1,500 people, including 150 scientists. It was like a mini Manhattan project, but for chemical weapons. In total, 100,000 soldiers were killed by chemical weapons in World War I. When Germany surrendered, Haber was crushed. All the money he made from his ammonia patent was lost to hyperinflation. In an attempt to pay off Germany's crippling war debt, he tried to distill gold from seawater. But the project was futile. In 1933, the Nazis came to power and passed a law that all Jewish civil servants, including scientists, were to be fired from their jobs. Haber was Jewish, but he never practiced the religion. Regardless, his military service exempted him from the law, but he resigned from his role as director in solidarity with all the Jewish scientists who worked at the Institute. The next year, in a hotel room in Basel, Switzerland, he died of heart failure. Damn. Kinesis pays you a monthly return in gold and silver simply for storing your precious metals with us, free of charge. When you purchase the gold and silver stored in our vaults. Oh my God, I don't get it. I don't understand. It's so complicated. The world is complicated. Immediately after World War I, Haber's Institute developed a cyanide-based insecticide. It had a barely detectable odor, so they mixed in a foul-smelling chemical to alert people to the danger. The resulting gas was called Zyklon B. A decade after Haber's death, the Nazis requested chemists remove the foul-smelling component. And this form of Zyklon B, the chemical developed at Haber's Institute, was then used to perpetrate the Holocaust to gas the Jews. Well, the guy who created it, patented it, Thinking was about this himself? story, it would be easy to paint Haber as a villain or as a hero for inventing the process used to feed half the world. But another approach is to regard him as irrelevant to the larger story because someone else would have figured out a way to process nitrogen out of the air and other scientists were developing chemical weapons. 
Over the past few centuries, science and technology have improved our lives immeasurably, but they have also given us ever-increasing ways to destroy ourselves. I think it'd be great to believe that we could ask scientists to only work on problems that are good for humanity, but the reality is that every bit of information is a potential double-edged sword. Most you don't I mean, know perfect. the outcome of your research. Everything has its pros and cons, but you're still gonna make scientific. Like it's a no-brain. Like it's not. It's not a question there. People are gonna make more scientific revolutions. They're gonna make more <gasps> advancements. Like it's 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 not gonna stop. When do you ever see this stopping? Do, do you see this stopping? I don't see it happening. I don't see anything changing. At all, you know, I really don't. Science has always been something that gets pushed very heavily, and it's always been at the forefront of everything, right? It's like one of those things where it's like this is where we're gonna we're gonna put the most money into because it's just so useful for us in every way, whatever it be, whether it be for good, whether it be for bad. Science is just useful. Search or how it might later be used. Ammonium nitrate is both a fertilizer and an explosive. So the real question is, how do we keep increasing our knowledge and control of the natural world without destroying ourselves and everything else on this planet in the process? Don't know. Can't have it, bo can't have it one way. Maybe you gotta just accept both ways. So chemistry has made it possible for 8 billion of us to live on this planet and to have the standard of living that we do. But as a byproduct, we've changed the atmosphere and now we're suffering the consequences in the form of more frequent and severe heat waves, among other things. Which brings me to an offer directly from me to you. I wanna offset one month of your carbon emissions and I'll do it with this video's sponsor, Ren. On their website, you can calculate how much carbon you emit and which activities have the- Shuts out. Shuts out our task and get your greatest ad in there. impact. And if you like, you can offset your emissions through. <clears throat> anyway, the scientist who killed millions and saved billions. I've never heard of this guy before. I never knew who he was. Fritz Haber. That's his name. Fritz ha Haber. Fritz Haber, right? Transformed the world. He says he might be irrelevant. I think that's a little harsh. You know, you can't. You never really want to say that for for these type of people. I mean, they make uh, this, this is some hard work that went into it. You know, sure, maybe somebody else would have done it. Maybe eventually, right? When enough money's been put into it, somebody else, right? I mean, you you just have to wonder. Somebody else would have done it. But that's not the that's not the point. You know, he did it. He got it first. He gets the, he gets that credit. He gets that recognition and to to, to realize that everything is a part of a duality. You know, it's not just one thing. You can't just ignore one thing and like everybody, like people wish they could, a lot of people do do that because it's easier. It takes up less cognitive resources. You know, they just blindside one aspect of life just because it makes things a little bit more congruent. It makes things more simple and, and, and very, you know, what's the word for it? Like, you know, smooth. But it, life is not like that. There's a lot of tension in life. You know, it's a duality. And there's a duality with Fritz. You know, he did something amazing. He did something beautiful. Maybe the only reason I'm alive right now. So, shouts out to Fritz. Um, but he also did do something which ended up killing millions, too. Because he was a patriot. But, of course, his, his invention was mainly just to save billions. That's, I guess, the driving force behind that, right? That was what he created all of that for. It just so happened that he was a patriot. He was like, well, it just so happens that I'm good and I patented this type of chemical thing. Maybe we can use this to end the war earlier. So maybe, you know, he, he said it, it seemed like even in war, his intentions weren't even all that bad. You know, he was like, maybe we can use this to end it quicker. Sure, people are going to have to die, but maybe less are going to have to die overall if we could end this quicker using this gas. Maybe that's what he was really thinking. But it's a duality. Sure, bad is gonna come from it. There's gonna be good from it too. Gotta take it all. I think he's. I think he's. He's. He's an important dude. He's an impactful dude. To just say that he's good. To just say that he's bad. Now that's doing it injustice. You know. That's. That's very. That's an oversimplification in my. In my book. Let me know what you guys think about this guy. Never had heard of him. Let me know what you. What you thought about the video. The reaction. Whatever. Um. 
I don't know if I'm gonna make another one after this. Might I might not this economics explained, bro? Aren't they don't they be fear mongering? I swear they be fear mongering, bro. It's one of the most commonly prescribed medications just, in the world. To have glucose these guys make a new video saying everything's gonna crash like every day. Is two quarters of negative real GDP growth. Now, most institutions these days no longer use that rigid framework for determining if we are or are not in a recession. But, uh... oh, I'll get into it. I'm not big into economics yet, but I'm getting into it, okay? Believe me. Why am I not charging my phone? Anyway, let me know what you guys think. Let me know what you guys want me to react to next. That was very potassium for you guys, okay? Science stuff. So let me know. Subscribe and all that good stuff. Yeah, yeah.